All right, for those of you that uh, uh, were on the first video, a uh, little technical difficulties. This is my first time using this platform, so we will uh, we will work through this together, but hopefully we don't have any more hiccups. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today's program is about the history of the Rock Island Arsenal Museum. Uh, the Rock Island Arsenal Museum is the second oldest army museum in the country uh, behind the West Point Museum, which was founded in 1843. Um, today's program will explore the history of the Rock Island Arsenal Museum uh, and also highlight a number of the, of the artifacts that we have in our collection. So the founding of the Rock Island Arsenal Museum is really the culmination of three unique events uh, that led to the founding of the museum and its opening in 1905. The first, uh, first event was on October 1st, 1903. Chief of Ordnance Major General William Crozier notified Rock Island Arsenal that 15 boxes of ordnance material would shortly be arriving for, quote, the purpose of preserving it in a military museum to be established at the Rock Island Arsenal. Uh, so basically, the chief of ordnance said, hey, I'm sending you some materials and you're going to have to um, you're going to have to build uh, some displays for uh, for those materials for a museum. Uh, the boxes themselves, the 15 boxes, included a large accumulation of largely weapons and accoutrement from foreign countries that had been forwarded over the years through U.S. embassies to the Office of the Chief of Ordnance for study. Um, a lot of these materials would actually end up being used during the 1909 Infantry Equipment Board, um, and that board would eventually produce what we know today as the Model 1910 Equipment, but a lot of the foreign materials that formed the core of the collections at the Rock Island Arsenal Museum um, came from its initial founding and were used for that purpose. Um, in correspondence to Colonel Blunt from Major General Crozier, he directed that a suitable building be selected as a museum to display this ordnance material for research and for the interest of the general public. The letter you see on this slide is that letter from the Chief of Ordnance um, dictating to Colonel Blunt, the commander of Rock Island Arsenal, um, about the founding of the museum that it would be done. The second event that um, that formed kind of the basis and the foundation of the museum was a small arms plant for the manufacture of the model 1903 rifle was established at Rock Island Arsenal in 1904. In order to make room for the manufacturing plant, the weapons and obsolete materials that had been stored at Rock Island Arsenal um, from its earliest years, so just after the Civil War, uh, those materials had to be uh, cleared out to make room for these assembly lines, which are what you see here on the screen. These are actually shots of Building 60, uh, which is the present location of the museum for those that are familiar. Uh, before this uh, material was disposed of to make room for the assembly lines, uh, it was decided that two examples of each firearm that they had and each piece of equipment they had would be selected and retained within the collection of the museum. Uh, so just to, just to catch everyone up, we are, you know, the founding of the museum is the 15 boxes of largely foreign materials and then two examples of everything that was being warehoused at the um, at the, uh, the arsenal starting in 1904. And then third, uh, probably the most interesting uh, piece of the collection and the founding of the, of the museum is the U.S. government had a display at the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, what we know as the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. Uh, what you see on this slide is actually the museum or the um, Hall of Industry, and then you actually see part of um, the government's displays on the right-hand side. This is actually from a, a stereotype. So at the conclusion of the World's Fair, portions of the government display were transported to Rock Island Arsenal uh, to be included in the museum. Among those items, 
were a shipment of weapons confiscated during the Philippine insurrection around the turn of the century, uh, very taxidermied horse specimens that had actually been shipped to St. Louis from the arsenal and then came back to us. Uh, they were models that were used in the harness shop. Uh, and we actually have one of those on display in the museum today. So we have a number of these items from the World's Fair and, and from the other various parts that made up the initial collections on display at the museum uh, today. So the museum itself uh, was originally housed in building 102, which is at the corner of Rodman and, um, and Gillespie. It's what's on the southeast corner of that intersection. Um, it was opened there on July 4th of 1905. Uh, the very first catalog of the collections there at the at the museum was published in 1909 and it references hundreds of materials including small arms accoutrement and ammunition that were in the collection of the museum the museum then uh, back in 1905 as it is today was known for its incredibly significant um, small arms collection uh, the museum itself was named the Ordnance Museum at Rock Island Arsenal, uh, so it housed all manner of different uh, different ordnance materials in its collection and had them on display. Uh, the museum itself, again, opened 1905, and it was opened until uh, World War I when it was actually closed down and packed up because the space was needed for warehousing and manufacturing. So all of the museum, its displays, its, um, its collections, all of that was packed up to make room uh, for, uh, for warehousing as well as um, manufacturing there in Building 102. At the request of the local community following the end of World War I, the museum was reopened in its original location on July 4th, 1919. This is actually a postcard showing the interior of the museum as it was in Building 102, so its previous location. Um, now it was called and renamed the Rock Island Arsenal Museum, uh, and the emphasis of the museum, however, still remained small arms and ordnance, even though they moved Ordnance Museum out of the proper title. Uh, for the first time, aspects of Rock Island Arsenal history were included in the museum display, so um, interpreting things like the history of Colonel Davenport, um, the various bridges, the early history of the Sack and Fox utilizing the island, um, the Civil War history, all these things were being interpreted for the first time in the museum. And you'll see that that aspect of the interpretation over time has really um, moved to the forefront, maybe more so than the ordinance emphasis that the museum had early on. Uh, so a little bit on the Ordnance Museum. So the Ordnance Museum designation was actually removed from Rock Island Arsenal in 1919 when it reopened and was given to a new museum that was being founded at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Aberdeen, Maryland. Um, the Ordnance Museum was at Aberdeen for years and years and years. Um, it has most recently been, uh, been moved and evolved into the U.S. Army Ordnance Training and Heritage Center, which is now located at Fort Lee, Virginia, as it is home to the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps and School. And that facility directly supports uh, the students at the uh, Ordnance Corps and School. So it's kind of interesting to know that there is a, there's a legacy that connects us you know, all the way from, from 1905 with the founding of the museum to Aberdeen and then again to Fort Lee in support of the, the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps mission. These are some additional images, again, from the museum when it was at, uh, when it was in Building 102. Uh, one thing you'll notice over time, uh, museum standards have changed greatly. Uh, the original displays were open racking like you see here. Um, you could touch the firearms. They were locked in place, but you could browse and touch at your, uh, to your heart's content. Uh, these, these actual racks have been repurposed. Uh, we, I think we've repurposed about six of them over time into the displays in the current museum. And so we actually harken back to some of the earliest aspects of the museum displays, even in the museum displays we have today. An additional shot down the middle of the uh, down the middle of the museum as it would have been between uh, 1919 and 
um, World War II. Uh, another thing to note, and this is a feature that is not consistent throughout the buildings, but in this particular building, in Building 102, you'll notice the columns um, are of a Greek style, so they're more ornate columns than you'll see in the other buildings uh, across the arsenal and even where the museum is today. Uh, this is an incredibly interesting uh, display they used to have at the museum. Uh, so, you know, we're, we tell the history of Rock Island Arsenal. Um, you know, manufacturing is our game. And what we have here are basically step-by-step -step processes for creating a variety of different equipment for soldiers. So, for example, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, um, that is a step-by-step -step from cutting out of sheet metal to, uh, to stamping to, you know, screwing on the top of a Model 1910 canteen. Um, and actually, a number of these, you know, processes um, the actual artifacts themselves are still retained in the collection at Rock Island Arsenal Museum, um, including the shovel in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the various uh, bits and spurs that you see on the right-hand side. Um, it's actually incredible to know, you know that there was an individual involved in every, every point along the way um, in the creation of sort of your final product. And this is a great example of displaying you know, what that looks like. So again, the museum still retains a number of these, um, of these sort of examples in its collection. It's in a great way to really think about um, you know, what it takes to make a canteen, uh, especially in 1919. Um, you know, they're not uh, you know, making it out of plastic anymore. It's actually you know, stamping out you know, out of sheet metal or uh, sheet tin, you know, what that, uh, what that form is and then kind of taking it from there. So it's an absolutely incredible look at, um, you know, the craftsmanship that it takes to make these items. Uh, one final shot of the museum as it appeared in building 102. Uh, again, you see the open racking, uh, very, very common in the early history of the museum. Um, but again, I also like to point out the two models you see here on this slide. Um, you have the Colonel Davenport house. Uh, this model was actually made by uh, a gentleman named M.E. Stropes from Company 2654 of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps was brought on to... Um, was brought onto the island in 1935 for a number of beautifying projects, so mostly landscaping across the arsenal. Uh, but during their time here, one of the members actually produced this model of the Cur Colonel Davenport House, uh, which, like many things I'm talking about today, are actually on display in the museum. Uh, also in the background, you'll see a model of Fort Armstrong, uh, also on display in the museum today. Fort Armstrong being uh, the first military post on the, uh, on the island. It was here from 1816 to 1836. Uh, and was headquarters for the U.S. Army in this region during the Black Hawk War. Uh, but it's really incredible to be able to see images of the museum as it was, be able to see images of the things that were in the collection uh, that we still have on display today uh, in the museum. So like during World War I, during World War II, the museum was again closed down, packed up, and put into storage to free up space for various warehousing um, and uh, various warehousing and manufacturing projects. Um, the museum was closed during World War II, and then it would reopen in May of 1948 in its current location, uh, which is on the north side of Building 60. Uh, the museum, when it reopened, was re or the museum would be reopened, uh, renamed. Sorry, the John M. Browning Memorial Museum in 1959, uh, in recognition recognition of Mr. Browning's contributions to ordnance technology and the armed forces. Um, again, the museum continued its legacy of being known for its collection of foreign U.S. military and civilian small arms. Um, it was just, and they were able to be displayed in in a more unique way. Um, you'll actually notice the courtyard of building 60 and 62, some tanks. Those, those are actually out at uh, Memorial Field now. And then these two cannon were actually um, recovered during the Spanish-American War and are still mounted, though not like this, in front of uh, the Rock Island Arsenal Museum. 
so this is the interior of the Rock Island Arsenal Museum in 1959 when it was dedicated as the John R. Brown or John M. Browning Memorial Museum. Again, um, standards have changed on a lot of these things. So you have a lot of just openly displayed artifacts that people can walk up and touch. Uh, we've obviously moved away from that in a lot of ways. In the back of this display, you'll actually see a lot of captured Filipino materials. Um, those would have been the things that would have been on display at the, the World's Fair in 1904. Uh, the one way I always know whether I'm looking at either the museum when it was in building 102 or the museum when it was in building 60 uh, is the unique flooring. So for anyone who's actually been to the museum, the Rock Island Arsenal Museum, um, one of the very distinct features is the red and black tile on the floor, which you can see, although this is a black and white photo, uh, you can actually see that tile um, on this. You'll also notice, and we'll probably see this in some upcoming images, uh, some differences in the columns. So these are actually pieced columns uh, in lieu of the more Greek ornate columns. Uh, this is a display uh, dedicated to John M. Browning about various uh, weapons that he contributed to and his contributions to uh, to the U.S. Army and U.S. military. Uh, you'll notice his picture at the very top of this display. Uh, the museum, as you probably have gathered right now, it has been ever-evolving. Uh, on July 1st, 1986, the museum would be renamed uh, again the Rock Island Arsenal Museum uh, to really reflect its primary purpose and mission. And this is the name we obviously carry today at the museum. Um, the focus of the museum has moved more towards the people, processes, and products of the Rock Island Arsenal. Um, and those are really the themes that drive the, the, uh, the interpretation of the museum today. Uh, again, the small arms collection obviously remains a very important uh, aspect of the museum's collection, but more focus is put on the actual history of the arsenal, including not just the manufacturing side, but also the various commands that you'll find across the installation. Um, and here are some images of, um, of the museum, not necessarily today, but as it, uh, as it has evolved over time. These are some of the display horses that I had mentioned earlier that were at the 1904 World's Fair. Uh, we still have one on display, although she's encased, um, largely due to the uh, taxidermy, per, uh, taxidermy process when she was made. Uh, she's loaded with arsenic, so certainly having her covered is incredibly important. And then this is, uh, I would say, one of the hallmarks of the museum, and that's the weapons wall. Uh, which is our transition into uh, talking a little bit about the various highlights of the collection, uh, some of which will be some callbacks uh, to some things we've mentioned already. All right, so what we have here is uh, a Springfield Model 1903 rifle. Um, the rifle itself, a little bit of background, uh, it was approved for manufacture by the Secretary of War in 1903. It is called the Springfield Rifle because it was designed and originally manufactured at Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts, and it was the standard issue weapon for U.S. infantrymen in World War I. Uh, now, we actually produce this rifle here, even though it's still known and called the Model 1903 Springfield Rifle. Uh, Rock Island produced a fair number of them um, between 1905 and 1921. And actually between 1905 and 1921, Rock Island Arsenal made a total of 3,521 um, rifles and, um, and continued production of fully assembled rifles until 1919 and then would later actually just do parts. Uh, the unique artifact that we want to talk about here uh, is actually this specific rifle. So uh, for those that um, are gun collectors or are interested in such things, um, serial numbers are very important. Uh, it allows us to track weapons. Um, when I conduct inventories, it's how I know what I'm looking at is what I'm looking at. Um, but serial number ones, so these are the first ones to come off the line, are incredibly rare and incredibly important. Uh, 
Serial number one of the bottle 1903 Springfield produced at Rock Island Arsenal um, came off the line in 1905 and immediately went over into the collections of the Rock Island Arsenal Museum. So this rifle actually had never been issued. Um, it's never been modified. It still is the original rod bayonet configuration. Um, and it actually, what I always think is a great connection um, the majority of the production line for the model 1903 rifle was actually in building 60, uh, which is again, where the museum is housed today. And so it moved from what was the future home of the museum to its old home in building 102, only to come back again to where it was made. Uh, so typically when I'm giving tours in the museum, um, this is a huge highlight piece for us because of its incredible history and the fact that it had never been issued out. Now, also included in the collection, uh, not shown here, but certainly worth noting, um, although this is the first serial number rifle to come off the line, uh, there also in the collection are two pattern model rifles. So these would have been fully, you know, full production rifles uh, that were sent to the chief of ordinance for review, and those came back. Those aren't actually stamped with serial numbers. They were never intended to be issued or to go anywhere, uh, but technically those are the first ones to come off the line, even though they don't have the serial number on them. Uh, but those are also part of the collection at Rock Island Arsenal Museum. Another great piece of history uh, we have here is the bell from the steamship Effie Afton. Um, the Effie Afton was uh, a steamboat that ended up crashing into um, the railroad bridge, the first railroad bridge crossing the Mississippi River, set off years of litigation about right of way across uh, the river by railroads and down the river by, um, by river traffic. Um, What's interesting about this piece is uh, when the Effie Afton sunk, the bell wasn't recovered. Um, and it was in 1926 during a dredging project that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, actually dredged this up. Unfortunately, the workers um, started to... <laughs> to chop it apart into little pieces for disposal instead of recognizing its actual importance um, and actual ability to, or the, you know, the ability to actually attach it to a specific uh, event and a specific boat. Um, Rock Island Arsenal Museum uh, was basically the benefactor of the small pieces and and received those pieces and then pieced it back together. So why I always like to bring up this piece is not just because, you know, of the importance of establishing uh, the important or establishing basically right away across or down the Mississippi River. So anyone that's ever sat on the government bridge waiting for a barge to go through, uh, you can blame the Effie Afton incident for that. Uh, but what I always like to point out about this is people assume, oh, well, this went down with a ship, so that must be why it's all broken up. Well, in fact, um, it's not that. It was the workers who dredged it up um, who would end up being the ones chipping it apart, not the wreck itself. Uh, so sort of just an interesting sidebar on that. All right. So um, during my time as director of the museum, I give a lot of these talks uh, out in the public and at the museum uh, about the collections, about what, you know, what we have at the museum. And, and one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, out of the, the roughly 1200 firearms you have on display, what are your favorites? Uh, you know, what are the most important? Which ones, you know, which ones do you like? Um, and this is a great cop out for me. So my favorite weapons uh, in the collection is actually a subset of weapons at the museum. And these are in fact part of the original uh, 1909 catalog. So sort of the first register of items held in the museum's collection. Um, and those are firearms recovered in the weeks after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Um, so the defeat of Custer and his 7th Cavalry in 1876. Uh, the museum was the recipient of the majority of both the um, both the soldiers' weapons and and along with a lot of the Native American weapons that were recovered following uh, following the battle um, and again the weeks after that. Now, why why are these so cool um, and why why these five? So we actually have dozens of weapons that were recovered from the Battle of the Little Bighorn Battlefield. What makes these five weapons unique? Um, is the history that we were able to discover years after they came 
to the museum. Uh, so in 1983, there was a brush fire that swept across the battlefield of the Little Bighorn. Um, what that did is it actually cleared off a lot of brush and allowed for archaeological teams from the Midwest Archaeological Center in Lincoln, Nebraska, to go in and conduct a thorough archaeological survey. And they conducted that survey from 1983 uh, to 1985. So a lot of what they found were actually shell casings. Uh, so what they did with the shell casings is they actually went, mapped them out uh, as they dug them up. That's what you see in the upper left-hand corner is where these things were, were found on the, um, on the battlefield itself. Uh, they, map, they mapped the, excavated, uh, sorry, the excavated field um, and allowed, it, it really allowed us to reconstruct the battle so completely uh, that movements of individual participants could actually be tracked. So this was an incredible event, you know, 100 years on. Uh, it really is incredible uh, to know, um, you know, to be able to discover this information again, 100 years after the fact and be able to then attach this to these, um, you know, to this battle. Now, let's bring it back to to the actual firearms and why why for me they're they're incredibly uh, important. So a lot of what they found again were shell casings and much like you and I have a unique thumbprint fingerprints, uh, weapons also have unique prints. Uh, they're what we call firing pin markings. In the lower left hand corner, uh, this is actually the firing pin uh, marking from one of the shell casings uh, that they found when they were digging. And so um, when, a, when you pull the trigger um, on, on weapons of this era, uh, it, it pushes a pin down which ignites uh, the bullet uh, and that's where you get that firing pin mark. So what they did is they, they had all these shell casings, they took photos of them, and then they went out to known collections of Little Bighorn weapons, and Rock Island Arsenal Museum was one of those known collections, and they dry fired, so basically just getting the mark off, not actually firing a bullet through the, through the gun, um, they got the markings off of the weapons at, at the Rock Island Arsenal Museum. And five of those weapons which are these shown here, uh, were found to be matches. So what they were able to do is they were able to take their maps where they had found these shell casings and they were able to map where these weapons were used across the battlefield. So it just, again, absolutely incredible to be able to add to the history of these, of these artifacts. You know, we knew they were at the battle, but to be able to say they were used, you know, at the last stand site or these were at the, the Reno Benteen site, you know, to be able to say those things and be able to say them with, uh, with you know, 100 percent accuracy um, is something that we never would have anticipated before. Uh, so, you know, it really is, you know, archaeolo archaeologists are doing some incredible work and certainly adding to a lot of the known and unknown history of, of artifacts every day. Another unique item uh, in the museum, uh, this is the saber of Brigadier General John Buford, um, a career cavalryman. Uh, John Buford was uh, basically the first on the scene at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, when he started seeing lead elements of the Confederate Army marching down the road, he understood um, that those were the lead elements of Lee's army and basically picked the ground uh, that uh, that the Battle of Gettysburg were fought, was fought on, uh, much to the success of the Union. Um, you know, he could be known as the man who saved the Union, uh, quite frankly. And so why do we have this? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, Buford was actually born in Kentucky, uh, but when he, he was a youngster, his family actually moved to Rock Island. And so he spent most of his childhood growing up in Rock Island, Illinois. Um, you know, we don't know if he ever came to the arsenal when he was growing up here. Uh, he was certainly aware of it. Um, and then he would go on uh, to graduate from West Point. Um, and then he would actually not see the end of the war. He would die before the war's end, before the Civil War's end. Um, but a local, uh, a local veterans group actually um, 
got this from the family and brought it into the museum. So, uh, you know, long story short, that's why, you know, we have a connection to to a man who uh, probably saved the Union during the Civil War. Um, and it's his saber that he carried uh, during during his service. So he actually carried the saber with him um, at the Battle of Gettysburg. So an incredible touchstone, an incredible piece of Civil War history, um, again, with a local connection and a local flavor. Uh, sticking with the Civil War, uh, you know, not all of our artifacts are necessarily three-dimensional, so to speak. So they're not all guns. They're not all um, they're not all swords. Uh, this is actually one of two uh, watercolors that we have uh, from a gentleman named John Gish. He was a Confederate prisoner of war, or POW, that was held at Rock Island Prison Barracks during the Civil War. Um, that's really Rock Island Arsenal's or Rock Islands at the time as before the Arsenal. Uh, their claim to fame was as home to to a prison barracks, uh, actually made famous um, in a novel some are probably familiar with called Gone with the Wind. Uh, one of the protagonists was sent there and um, it was called the Andersonville of the North, obviously making reference to the horrible conditions in Andersonville. Um, in fact, it wasn't nearly nearly that harsh, although this far north uh, during the wintertime is harsh on everyone. Uh, what's incredible about these, um, these two watercolors, and here's the first one, and here's the second one, very similar, uh, but they do provide a great snapshot of sort of prisoner life um, during the Civil War at the prison barracks. Uh, almost looks idyllic. But what you'll see, um, you know, at the center of this one, uh, you'll actually see a wagon with horses. There was a sutler that was allowed to come through and, and sell things to, to the prisoners. Um, and that's actually the origin of these two watercolors. Uh, Mr. Gish actually would have, and he produced more watercolors like this, uh, but he would have made these to sell to the local community and use that money to purchase, you know, additional food, supplemental food, supplemental uh, clothing, those sorts of things. Um, also in the, these images, you'll see, um, you know, you'll see prisoners playing games. Uh, you'll see prisoners carrying water from the two wells that were located um, within the stockade. Um, and then you also get a great shot of also the barracks, um, you know, the 12 foot wall that surrounded the entire facility. And for those of you who are familiar with the island itself, the barracks uh, was basically located um, from from quarters one along the river uh, to about where East Street is. Uh, and there's actually a marker uh, marking where one of the corners of the stockade was at the bottom of East Street. So again, just down from Building 90 or Garrison headquarters. Uh, so that's where that's where the stockade would have been. But again, you know, it's incredible how vivid these are, um, you know, more than 150 years on. And again, they also provide us a great snapshot of, of prisoners' life uh, during, uh, during the war in, in a way we probably otherwise would not have. Um, Sticking with with probably less than uh, or lesser known, I should say, items within the collection. Uh, so the arsenal was also featured um, in, in a comic book, interestingly enough, um, called This Is Wild Dog. This is actually part three of a four part miniseries by um, by Muscatine natives Max Allen Collins and Terry Beatty in 1987. Um, in this issue, three of four, uh, Wild Dog, uh, who you see on the cover here, uh, is actually defending the arsenal from some super 80s looking um, terrorists. But what's great about this is you're, you're, you have two native uh, Iowans who are clearly familiar with the arsenal in one way or another. And you see some great landmarks uh, noted on here. So you have the old water tower uh, in that third panel down. You have the uh, the gate. Um, but the coolest part about this particular um, comic is that the Rock Island Arsenal Museum is featured very prominently. Uh, so prominently, in fact, that some of the terrorists uh, break in, uh, take hostages, and Wild Dog breaks into one of the museum's displays, grabs a 30 caliber machine gun, and starts to let loose um, on these Miami Vice-looking uh, looking terrorists wearing 
bikinis and, and Hawaiian shirts. You know, as much as the, they knew what the arsenal looked like, um, I don't know how many terrorists are cruising up and down the Mississippi wearing, wearing bikinis and Hawaiian shirts. But again, uh, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, but anyways, absolutely incredible to have sort of this uh, this connection between the comic book world uh, and the real world. Uh, interestingly enough, a version of Wild Dog actually debuted, um, I had to look this up, but debuted in season five of the CW's TV show Arrow. Uh, so Wild Dog lives on. They haven't contacted us yet about filming this particular uh, particular piece within the museum, but I would certainly be open as long as uh, nobody kicked open any of our displays. Uh, so, you know, that's that's the history of the museum and, and a number of highlights that we have in our collection. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to the comments for any questions anyone may have. Uh, but before I start that, I just wanted to let everyone know um, we have a a bunch more of these upcoming virtual programs. I hope you enjoyed today's. Um, so check on our events page for any upcoming programs. I can tell you on Monday, December 7th, we'll have a program about the attack on Pearl Harbor. On Sunday, December 20th, we will have an in-depth discussion on the Rock Island prison barracks. So that's the Civil War Confederate POW camp. On Monday, January 11th, we will have a talk um, on the pre-World War II Army maneuvers. Um, and Sunday, January 24th, we'll have a talk on women in World War I that'll give special focus to women workers on the arsenal. Uh, so with that, like I said, I will turn it over to the comments for any questions anyone may have. And thank you for joining us today. I truly appreciate it. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you.